Um, thank you, Tallahassee Nurseries, for inviting me. Um, we're gonna we're talking bite back here. We're gonna try to prevent mosquitoes before they get us. Uh, I'm Mark Tanzig. I think we um, well. I think there's a slide in here about it. I haven't done this particular one in a while, but I'm Mark Tanzig. I'm the horticulture agent at UF IFAS Extension on Paul Russell Road. Does everyone know about UF IFAS Extension? Raise your hand. Couple hands, all right. Uh, has anyone been to the demonstration garden in our uh, facility on Paul Russell Road? I haven't lately, but I haven't even started in years. All right, well, thank you, ma'am. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, that's right. The demo garden used to be here at Tallahassee Nurseries, actually. Um, <laughs> so um, when you have time and you're down on the south side of town, please come by because we have a large demonstration garden. You know, all the plants are labeled. Lots of examples of what you can use in your own lawn. We talk a lot about Florida friendly practices. And then there's also really, it's the sustainable demonstration center as well. So we have solar panels, we have geothermal heating and air, we have underground storage tanks. So it's a really cool facility to come just check out. So, you know, uh, I'm going around giving these presentations so we don't have, you know, some of this. You know, kids want to go outside and play, hang out, and they're afraid of mosquitoes. So, you know, try to lessen this a little bit. So again, I'm the horticulture agent. You might be wondering, what am I doing talking about mosquitoes and mosquito control? Well, a lot of the things that we encourage folks to do in their lawn and garden are perfect breeding habitats for mosquito larvae, especially what we're going to talk about, the really bad ones that, you know, spread some the human diseases. So, you know, Florida friendly landscaping, there's these nine principles and we encourage things like the use of rain barrels, attracting wildlife by using bird baths and again those are all just perfect conditions for mosquito larvae. So I thought it was the responsible thing to do to come out and talk about you know how you control you know how you reduce the potential for mosquitoes in your backyard. So here's the overview with the most important being that you know reducing the the source of mosquitoes in your backyard. So we are from Florida. I put this in here. This is one of the first explorers that came to Florida and this was their depiction. This is what they drew when they got here. I don't know if you can tell what's going on. It says sand as a defense against mosquitoes. And these are guys that buried themselves in the sand trying to get away from the mosquitoes. So uh, as Floridians, we shouldn't be too um, surprised that there's yet another mosquito borne disease that's affecting us. Um, it's part of living in the in the warm area and actually now you know uh, you know mosquitoes in the summertime are everywhere but here in Florida we have a long warm um, season so we we have them a lot more than than most other places and then going back in time mosquitoes and man you know humans have been dealing with diseases that mosquitoes carry since we became human um, here is a you know like Jurassic Park a mosquito in amber from 60 million years ago and it's true, the, the scientists have actually got DNA out of mosquitoes stuck in amber. They didn't make dinosaurs with it, but uh, it really does happen. So mosquitoes have been around for a long, long time, and again, have been affecting us, you know, since we've been human. G keeping on going through history, you know, agriculture started 10, 12,000 years ago, and when that happened, there were more humans in centralized locations, clearing the forest, growing uh, crops, that made even um, more likely for mosquitoes to come and, and bite us and spread disease. Um, so when I saw this old picture of uh, an old uh, mortar and pestle, you know, all I see is that if it rains, you know, it's not like they had, you know, nice homes and everything. This stuff just sat out. You know, that's, a, that's mosquito larvae breeding habitat right there. Um, uh, and then, you know, the Romans actually, the fall of the Romans is associated with disease carried by mosquito. And this is, uh, this is Hippocrates, um, and he, uh, malaria actually comes from mal air, which is, you know, a lot of folks in Roman time were dying. They associated these fevers and other diseases with this stale air, swampy areas. Um, so we've been talking about mosquitoes for a long, long time. This is in the Middle Ages where we went through some really, uh, you know, kind of extreme measures to try to uh, uh, cure ourselves of these diseases. We didn't know what they were coming from. We had an idea, bad air, but, you know, bloodletting and belladonna, um, you know, it's a pretty extreme way to try to cure yourself of mosquito-borne disease. And again, it was so important in human history. Shakespeare's got it mentioned in like eight of his plays, the, you know, malaria, mosquitoes, stale air. Then we start moving on to you know, the, the age of exploration and moving everywhere. Um, 
moving around the world. Um, and actually, a lot of these mosquito-borne diseases are not in any of the records of the ancient uh, Americans, uh, North and South America. So a lot of these diseases were brought from the old world to the new world um, through, um, you know, just exploration and, and colonialism type stuff. Uh, this was a major breakthrough right here. This is the quinine tree. So, um, back before, we'll, we'll skip a little bit. This fella here is Carlos Finlay. He was actually the one that figured out that mosquitoes were the ones spreading this disease. Um, this was in the late 1800s and him and Walter Reed, so that name sound familiar to folks, Walter Reed. Walter Reed and Mr. Finlay actually discovered that and it was a huge breakthrough because now they knew why, especially like soldiers, would die in these tropical areas, were getting these diseases and dying, uh, was from mosquitoes. So then they could start providing mosquito netting and mosquito repellent, you know, to save soldiers' lives. And a lot of it was uh, this quinine tree was actually found before, you know, they figured out it was mosquitoes. They realized that the quinine tree would actually cure malaria. And it's a really cool story of how they figured this out. Um, you know, these sick animals would go to these ponds and would seemingly get cured of whatever ailments they had. And what they realized with all these quinine trees had fallen into these little ponds and basically steeped and the quinine was in the water. And so the scientists put it together and they started using quinine to cure malaria. So really cool uh, story of mosquitoes back in through time. Here is the US, I think this is from the late 1800s. This is uh, malarial cases in the United States. You see we're nice and dark, meaning we had a lot of uh, mosquito disease. And basically this is showing that mosquito disease slowed development of the whole South. Um, you know, a lot of folks didn't want to come down here because there was so many mosquitoes, so much disease. And you can't see it on this map, but this whole section right here of Florida on an old map was just called Los Mosquitos. <laughs> so, um, you know, Development of Florida really didn't, you know, large scale development didn't happen until like the early 1900s. And guess when screens were invented? The early 1900s. So you can, you know, that's what got us down here. And so here's some local history of mosquito uh, works. So, you know, we figured out it's mosquitoes spreading these diseases. Um, mosquitoes live in wetlands. Uh, our first thing to do was we started draining these wetlands. So this is actually pictures from Leon County back in the 30s and the 50s. Um, these are folks digging mosquito control ditches uh, around Leon County. Um, we now know that this wasn't the most you know, it wasn't the best thing to do because a lot of our wetlands are actually now dredged and, you know, we didn't really realize the, the importance of some, a lot of these wetlands and we drained a lot of them doing mosquito control products and a lot of the big ditches you see around town were old streams um, where they went and they dug them out to drain some of the swamps and so now that's why when you go down Adams uh, near Orange, um, near FAMU area, you know that big kind of dug out huge Grand Canyon looking thing. You know, at one point that was a natural little stream, but we, you know, we dredged it to drain the waters. Um, and then that just kind of created more and more erosion to dig it deeper and deeper. Uh, but, you know, at the time that was the best thing we could do. Later on in the 1900s, uh, we started using DDT. And DDT was very, very effective at reducing the amount of mosquitoes around Unfortunately, it was also really good at killing, you know, vertebrates and mammals up the food chain. So this is a famous book, Silent Spring. Um, Rachel Carson kind of talked about how the use of all these pesticides was killing things like bald eagles. Bald eagles almost went extinct. So in 1972, the EPA banned the use of DDT. So we had to start coming up with new ways. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit and talk about some products you can get today to help control mosquitoes. Um, DDT is still used in other parts of the world. So like down in um, the Caribbean where Zika is really bad right now, uh, they are still using DDT to control it because that's the best product they have um, down there. So let's get into mosquito biology. Check that out. Do you know mosquitoes bit snakes? It's pretty wild, huh? Um, so there's around, that, that we know of, there's 3,500 species globally. There's 80 here in Florida. And of those 80, there's 13 of them that are capable of causing disease to animals. That's humans and other animals. So dogs uh, get heartworm. That's spread through mosquito bites. Um, 
there's only three species most likely of capable of infecting humans in Leon County. So, you know, we got 13 in the state that can cause disease to different, you know, animals. Here in Leon County, there's three that we need to worry about. And two of those three thrive in urban landscapes. And again, that's why I'm here talking to you guys because they, you know, there's two in particular, the bad guys, that they prefer habitats that are right around our homes and gardens. Um, and we're going to get into those. So here's the first one. This is the most common one we have around here that's really annoying to us. The little black and white fellow that you see out in the daytime, that's the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus. Um, this is important. This is a daytime feeder that prefers artificial containers. I remember that. It's a daytime feeder, prefers artificial containers. This is a carrier of dengue and Zika with a star because it hasn't been implicated in any of the recent Zika um, outbreak that's been down south. Um, but there has been two documented cases and they've also, in the lab setting, they have shown that Zika can be carried through this Asian tiger mosquito. Um, naturally, um, it's only been implicated twice, once in Mexico, once in Uganda. Um, so they're thinking different reasons why it's less capable of carrying Zika, partly because it's more, it'll feed on many different things. Um, and the places where it has happened, there have longer, you know, warm seasons. So um, let's go to the next one. This is the yellow fever mosquito. This is Aedes aegypti. This is the main carrier of Zika in the Caribbean and down in South Florida. And you can see again, this is a daytime feeder that prefers artificial containers. Along with Zika, of course it carries yellow fever, that's where it gets the name, and dengue. Um, we'll get into some more. The, they think this one is more of a carrier of Zika rather than the Asian tiger because it solely likes to feed on humans. Uh, that's its main um, food source uh, for, for the blood meals uh, for, of the females. So here's their range. Um, you can see they're kind of uh, in the, you know, somewhat warmer parts, although they do get up into these areas in the summertime. Um, this is a really cool story for me as a biologist. So prior to 1986, 80s aegypti, the real bad guy, the yellow fever mosquito, was throughout Florida. That was the only daytime biting mosquito we had in Florida. Now, in 1986, the Asian tiger mosquito, that 80s albopictus, was um, found in Jacksonville. So what's in Jacksonville that could have brought that thing here? The port. Right. Now, guess how uh, these invasive, these are invasive mosquitoes, right? Neither one of these are native to Florida, but guess how albopictus got here? Can anyone guess the industry that would have brought it uh, all around the world, really? No, no, this is later on. This is in the 80s. <laughs> huh? Nope. The, the global used tire trade. <laughs> I didn't even know there was a used tire trade in the world, but apparently uh, it's a big thing. We take our old used tires and we ship them all over the world. And I guess we give our old tires to third world countries and they use them till they, you know, the belts, the steel belts start to show. I don't really know, but that's how it got spread all around the world, really. Um, so you can see in 1986 it started here and then by 94 it was statewide, basically. And the really cool thing is that these two invasive, you know, they're exotic mosquitoes, not from here. They basically started to compete for each other for resources. And what happened is the Asian tiger mosquito, this is the map now, it basically pushed the yellow fever mosquito out of north and central Florida because it was better at, you know, gathering resources. It could handle the cooler weather a little bit better. Um, so this is a really neat uh, example of invasive species coming and basically battling it out. Um, and what happened is the yellow fever mosquito is, the yellow fever mosquito is, you know, is the primary mosquito down in the Keys um, and probably in Miami-Dade, that's where that Zika is now, um, and down further in the Caribbean. This area, red area right here is where they're kind of like a mixing zone. So there's the Asian tiger and the yellow fever. They're breeding and the good thing is when they breed, they actually are, their offspring aren't, um, they're sterile. So that's a good thing. So that's a pretty cool story. Uh, the one more that we have that, um, that can spread disease is this Culex. Poor guy doesn't even have a, like a common name. Uh, he's a night feeder um, and he prefers floodwaters, so swamps and that kind of stuff. 
This one's really cool because it can hold on to its eggs until conditions are right. The females can actually, you know, female mosquitoes actually, you know, you might actually see this. They kind of fly around, they kind of like dip their little butts in the water here and they go over here and do the same thing. And they're basically trying to find out the best spot for their larvae. Um, this one here, uh, the females, the eggs are ready to go, but it can actually wait until the floodwaters come up and it's just the right time for those, those eggs to go in and it's going to give the best chance for the larvae to succeed. So, uh, pretty cool. Um, now this one that carries West Nile, encephalitis, and also the heartworm in the dogs. Um, here's a little bit about mosquito biology. So, we kind of get this. Here's the, here's the adults. Which one, which one bites? Females. Females are the only ones that are the only mosquitoes that bite you. Um, so we have an adult female. Um, she lays her eggs. They're like little black dots that you'll see kind of on the edge of containers. Um, those eggs hatch into larvae. Those are the little wigglers you see sometimes in the water. And then, I don't know if anyone has ever seen pupa, but pupa are kind of like these, they look like a polywog or like a, almost like a, a small tadpole, you know. Um, where they're kind of close to the surface, they don't really swim very much. Those are like in the final stages before it emerges as an adult. They don't move very much, uh, they don't eat very much. Uh, then those pupa kind of hang out at the top, the adult emerges and the whole cycle goes on and on and on. This whole thing can take about a week or two. Uh, so they're, you know, when it's cold, uh, an adult can live, you know, maybe several months, but typically, especially in the warm season, you know, they're only alive for about a week. Uh, these are, you know, lots of generations. Um, let's see, what else here? The larvae are actually feeding on organic matter and other critters in the water in the containers that they're growing in. Um, or the, the swamps. This is just the mosquitoes in general. Uh, it's kind of cool. Some larvae will actually eat other mosquito larvae. And they'll eat small other insects, you know, insect larvae that's in the, in the ponds. Uh, and as we know, you know, when it gets down below 50 degrees, they're pretty much inactive. When it gets cool, they don't really hang around much. They're not active and unfortunately their eggs can overwinter. So if they lay their eggs and we get a, you know, the, the winter comes, hopefully we'll get a good fall and winter this year. Um, their eggs can actually overwinter in, you know, wetlands and wet spots until the following spring when things warm up, they can then hatch and start over again. All right, we talked about the males and the females. The, here's a male. Uh, females are the only ones that feed. Uh, who knew that mosquitoes were pollinators? Mosquitoes are pollinators. They actually fly around and just like bees and butterflies, they're actually using nectar from plants to get energy to fly. The females gather our blood because uh, eggs take a lot of protein and resources. So they're getting a really high you know, energy rich food source through our blood. And if you go, if you really, if you kind of want to get grossed out a little bit, maybe if you're queasy, don't go check this out. But NPR website, if you uh, search for mosquito biting on the NPR website, they, they did something. Some researchers actually took some, it looks like skin, but they got a camera underneath it. And they in slow motion show what's going on when the mosquito is biting you. It's not one little needle that's getting you. There's actually seven little um, needles that are going into you. One of them's basically sawing through your skin and it kind of goes like this. <laughs> Tell me if you need me to stop. When I, you, know. Uh, you know, one of them saws like this. One of them is injecting saliva. Two more are injecting, well there's two sawing you. Two that are injecting saliva into you and because the saliva actually has a uh, well, let's see, do I have, it's got a painkiller in there that, so you don't feel it. And then the last one goes in and actually sucks the blood. And I don't have a picture of this because it's a little gross, but as they're filling up with blood, it, they can actually condense the water out of the blood and the little like drops of water kind of fall out of their bottom um, because they're just getting as much blood as they can. It's pretty amazing stuff. Um, so again, the females gather blood for their protein source. Um, they're attracted to carbon dioxide, so that's how, they're, that's how they find us. They feed on all sorts of things, humans, dogs, birds, frogs, lizards, caterpillars even, will get bit by mosquitoes. Um, and it's those salivary glands where they're injecting the saliva with the painkiller, that's where they're passing on these diseases, it's in their saliva. Um, again, it's not the mosquitoes that are really getting you sick, it's this virus inside the mosquito. 
here's a bunch more. They, they did not come from my yard. <laughs> but this has definitely existed in my yard before. But, uh, you know, a wheelbarrow sitting out, all you got to do is, you know, put it on the side, put it under the shed. Tires. These are, this is the main um, habitat of these disease carrying mosquitoes. Um, so, say you have a tire swing for your kids, your grandkids, just pop some holes in there and make sure the water drains out. Uh, or use some large size. Here you got an old hot tub. Um, mosquito control. We've had the two um, cases of travel related Zika down in Leon County. Mosquito control has gone out and canvassed the neighborhood and has tested for mosquitoes. They found a lot of larvae in old hot tubs that weren't being used, um, just old buckets. So that's a classic one. We'll talk about some larvae size that'll help you with that. And here's, you know, the garden garden. Here you go, gardeners. That little tray underneath your pot is perfect for skeeters. Um, kids, there's some, well, she, she didn't go out of there, but you know, kids, your old kiddie pools and buckets. This could easily come out of my yard. I got plenty of old buckets in my yard, but I was with them over. Uh, here's some more pictures. These come from my yard. I'm holding on to some of the boat right down in the backyard, but I have to go out every time after it rains and I have to drain the tarp over the boat because it holds water for several days. Um, and I've seen mosquito logging start to breed in there, so I go dump it out every couple of days. This is our little, you know, cover on the patio furniture out back. Um, same thing, got to go around and, and drain those out. This is a funny story. I was going around in the morning taking all these pictures, and my mom was visiting, and by the time I came back, she was getting on me. She was like, Mark, she had drained all these. And she was like, Mark, you got to drain these from mosquitoes. I was like, Mom, I'm getting to it. These are my props. <laughs> Mess me up. Uh, this is my backyard. Here's my rain barrel spot, and that little bit of water in there will breed mosquitoes. So every now and again, especially after the rain, you gotta make sure you go and you dump all that stuff out. Um, these, all these plastic pots that gardeners seem to collect, uh, a lot of them like to bring them to the extension office when they get a big chunk of them and leave them for us, which is nice, although we're starting to get a bunch now too. Um, these need to be, these will even hold water, even though they have holes in them. Once you get a big stack of them together, they will hold water. So you can see mine are all kind of cattywampus and on the side, because every now and again, I'm just going through there and I'll move them around and make sure they drain and don't hold water. Um, tomato steaks made out of bamboo, or some bamboo fence you might have. Uh, that little crevice uh, will definitely hold water and bring mosquitoes. And you then, uh, you know, little, little holes, little uh, old branch, branches that came off. Down south, they're really concerned about bromeliads. So everyone knows bromeliads. Uh, bromeliads are like, uh, looks like pineapple, or, or you know, there's these tropical food plants that um, they hold water because they, you know, that's how they, that's part of their life. You know, they're, they're holding water for their own needs. But mosquitoes breed in those bromeliads. So, um, they're good. Gutters. Who likes to clean out gutters? Nobody. Uh, but if your gutters are clogged and they got a bunch of uh, leaves in there and or a saggy spot that's going to collect water, mosquitoes will breed it. Definitely not my yard here. This came off the web. Um, this is perfect habitat. All sorts of places for water to collect uh, and mosquitoes to breed. Looks like there's a mosquito flying across the street. Uh, and again, not my yard. Hopefully, you don't have a neighbor like this. But uh, when it gets this bad. You, know, you definitely want to call mosquito control and say, hey, I've got a big source of mosquitoes next door to me. They can come out. They can talk to the property owner maybe, maybe uh, do some fogging. Uh, and this is also, uh, you might be able to call code enforcement if it's getting this bad. That's starting to get pretty bad. Uh, so how do you control these things? Uh, that's why you are here, right? You want to kill these things. So really the best thing, I think, are these large sites. And... Larva size, if you have a spot that you can't easily uh, drain every three to five days, then you're going to want to use a larva size. And some of the most common products are these mosquito dumps. Uh, and this is actually the same material, it's in a granular form. Um, these are for sale right over there in the, in the shop. Um, but these are great because these are made with this BTI product, this Bacillus thuringiensis, it's rarances. So, organic gardener, you're a BT. Right, BT is an organic um, insecticide, organic garden. And do is basically a bacteria. And this particular strain is specific to mosquitoes, midges, and black flies. None of them really you want hanging around about your house. So 
Uh, it does not harm butterflies, bees, fish, frogs. And how it works is, you know, here's the bacteria in the microscope. Here's the real close in. These are actually the, the spores. So it's when the bacteria goes to reproduce, it creates these really sharp um, kind of spore-like um, uh, bodies. And the larvae get this into their digestive tract, and it basically cuts them from the inside out. Now, it sounds poisonous and cruel, but they're mosquitoes. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the great thing about these, again, is they're specific to mosquitoes. And, you know, some of these other things, but midges, you normally have a bunch in your yard. Those are mostly going to be out in the, um, in the lakes and swamps. Sometimes you go to a lake, and you see all these things that look like really huge mosquitoes, kind of washed up on shore, those are the, those are the midges. Um, and their uh, larvae look like, they call them blood worms, they're like little tiny larvae that are quite red, kind of gross. Uh, and black flies, again, those are like uh, trash, they're attracted to trash and ones around here. Okay, adult decides. So this is to kill the adult. Typically these are fogs and aerosols, right, because adult mosquitoes fly, so you gotta disperse the product so that it's gonna get on them. Um, typically, these are made of pyrethroids or pyrethrins. Um, pyrethrins are a natural product, actually, that comes from this plant right here. Uh, this is a composite member that I'm in Africa. And why would a plant create, why would a plant like this have, you know, insecticides in it? It wants to be pollinated by things that are not mosquitoes. Uh, no, well, close. But it doesn't want things to chew on. It doesn't want insects to come eat up its leaves. So it created, uh, you know, a chemical defense. And scientists figured it out. Those so scientists. Uh, and so that's pyrethrins. Pyrethroids are like a manufactured version of that in the lab, uh, but same kind of uh, chemical structure. Um, and while I'm there, these are some products. This is this is actually permethrin, which is not a natural product exactly like permethroids, but it's it's close. Um, this is for adults. And again, we talked about the, the foggers. You know, they actually sell the foggers here with some of these products that go in it. This one had a lot of things that I don't know these here. Uh, three five oxybenzyl. Um, they're going to be kind of manufactured products. Um, the only, uh, so those are the three things they also use maladol, which is an organophosphate. Um, the thing with these adulticides is they are not specific, they're broad spectrum. So if you spray this and, and you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's just landing on the vegetation where they may be present, they're going to go get on that vegetation and it's going to get through their bodies and it's going to mess with their nervous system and they're going to die. These things are going to kill other insects that you may want around your beneficial insects. So you want to be careful with these. Um, and this is why the fog trucks no longer go out during the day, is because if they went out during the day, they'd be killing bees and butterflies, and dragonflies, you know, things that we want to keep around. Um, so that's why the fog trucks are only going out in the evening, mostly getting those nuisance ones. Because remember, we talked about those. The ones that carry the worst disease are the daytime virus, right? So the nuisance ones, like our native mosquitoes, come out in the evening. They carry encephalitis and West Nile. I mean, it's not good, and they're just a pain. They're annoying. Uh, but those daytime virus have, like, hunkered down for the evening. And so the fogging has kind of limited use against these really bad daytime virus. So that's why, it's, you know, we need to do more around our homes to drain our you know, standing water, use the larvicides um, to slow them down, um, in the, you know, slow those daytime ones down. Um, again, that's why the, you know, they're gonna have limited effectiveness against the two main disease carrying species. Uh, this is a new thing um, that uh, people are working on. These are the GMO mosquitoes. So there's two ways they can do this. Um, they can either try to reduce, they can put a gene into the mosquitoes to make the mosquitoes resistant to the disease, particular disease, um, or they can insert a gene that makes the mosquitoes sterile after they mate. So, you know, personally, if they're going to do some of this kind of stuff, and they're actually, they've approved it down the keys, and they're letting loose these, uh, uh, these sterile males, so they're they're genetically changing the males so that they're sterile and letting them loose. And when those males mate with the females, 
the, the offspring are, are they're no good for their eggs on that. So personally, I like that method better than trying to put a gene into the mosquito to prevent it from getting the disease. Because these viruses, as we know, they change rapidly, and before you know it, they'll be resistant to that gene and have to come up with some other gene. Um, but that's GMO. A lot of people are, you know, they don't like this idea, and a lot of people I know down in Key West, you know, a lot of residents came out against it. Um, I think it was it was passed, and you know, we'll see what happens down there. And you know, remember down in the Keys, they had a really bad yellow fever mosquito. That's the remaining mosquito. They're really concerned about it down there. Let's see. So, other prevention methods besides some of the the larvicides and herbicides. All right, cover up. When I'm in the garden, I don't wear this. This is next. When I'm in the garden, I have long sleeve, you know, shirt on, jeans, a hat, closed toed shoes. The only place they can really get me are my hands and right around my face, and I can see them and I can get them. Um, yeah, you know, sure, I love the garden in the summertime in shorts and a t-shirt, and it's really hot outside, but I will get eaten alive by mosquitoes. We talked about it. They love me. They come to me. They are attracted. There is there is something about the people's, uh, it's mostly pheromones. It's not really our blood. It's the way we smell. So, <laughs> sorry, whoever's out there that thinks they had sweet blood, it's actually just got good smell for the mosquitoes. Um, so, yeah, I just covered up. And you can see these are researchers down every place it looks like. Uh, you can see they're very well covered up. The only mistake they made is they left their dorm. <laughs> I did some uh, some classes down in the Everglades, uh, tropical botany classes, and I'm telling you, the door is open for like just enough time to get you know 15 people in the van, and you've got hundreds of mosquitoes uh, in your in the van. Who's been to the Everglades in the mosquito season? Yeah, it's pretty insane, right? It's crazy. Uh, when we were in that tropical botany course, my professor who had a very white um, beard, he was going on and on about the plants and their relatives in this country and that country and what the characteristics are about all these plants. And the whole time, I mean, his, it looked like it, you know, it was like pepper in his white beard with all these mosquitoes. And we kept saying, oh, come on, let's go, Dr. Judge. We're getting eaten alive. We were breathing them in. So it's crazy down there. So you definitely want to cover up uh, and be safe. Other ways, if you're going to be in the woods, especially, um, you might want to wear something like this. These are nice and breathable. Um, and then what you can also do is you can spray repellent on top of this, and it gives you a little extra protection. Um, this is a little hat trick. I didn't bring my hat, I forgot. But you know, this goes over your hat, you tuck it into your shirt, and it works pretty well. Um, when I first graduated college, I worked for a, um, a local agency here, and I did a lot of field work in the woods, and the worst place I went to besides Everglades was they all still a swamp, and you know, you have this, you have gloves, you spray it down, and the mosquitoes are still coming after you. I mean, I had a time where I walked backwards, and you could see the cloud of mosquitoes falling into the woods. It was pretty intense. All right, wear repellents. If you don't want to cover your skin, um, then you need to, you know, if you're worried about mosquitoes, you need to put some good repellent on you that's going to work. Um, we have some, we have one here. So, this one here is for sale, 25% deep. You can see this is a list. This was actually research done by the University of Florida, the Florida Medical Entomology Lab. If you guys are interested, um, they have a lot of those pictures of the larvae. They have a lot of great information on their website uh, to check out. So, they did research, and you can see the best coverage, five hours, was by the high percentage deep. Um, the only thing about deep is, you know, you get much higher, and that stuff will melt plastic. Um, it'll take the paint off your car, so, you know, what it's doing to your skin, I can't say. But, you know, that's why if you're going to use something like this, and you need that long sleeves and then spray this over you, uh, definitely read the directions when you spray it. Uh, take care. So follow directions, make sure you don't hurt yourself with deep. Um, and you can see it goes down to zero. So citronella candles, I'm sorry, they really don't do anything. You probably already figured that out. Uh, citronella plants, I'm, I'd love for you guys to go out and garden and you know buy plants and all, but they don't do anything either. Like maybe if you rub it and you stand over top of it, you know, you might get some protection. Well, candles will help you put them close to you. If you put them close to you, they might. I always put them right there, and they don't bother. And they work pretty good? Well, good. But you got to be right there. You got to be right on top of it, right? Yeah. And it would depend maybe on which way the wind's blowing, because, you know, other way, otherwise the mosquitoes are going to, they're going to hunt you down. They're going to find you. Uh, but, like, skin's so soft. 
My mom used to slather me with that stuff when I was younger. And mosquitoes die on you. They like get stuck on you. You know, you got to get mosquitoes to get out of your skin. And then I saw this and I was like, hey, she only gave me three to ten minutes worth of protection for all that oil she was having on me. Um, the only like natural one here is this repel lemon eucalyptus. So oil of lemon eucalyptus and this pea mint thing, which I'm not really sure what that is. That was the only one that didn't contain DEET that provided you a good amount of coverage, two hours. Uh, this actually 10% citronella, that was only 20 minutes though, so you can see. And I think a lot of the, this is a lot of what you'll see, the citronella with lemongrass and geranium oil. That was only 20 minutes worth of coverage. So, um, the best one for sure, for coverage, if you're concerned, is the DEET though. Uh, unfortunately, the one with the best, you know, the most kind of, you know, it's pretty serious stuff. That's the one that works, though. Uh, so the other thing is those uh, those cell phone apps, apparently, that put off some supersonic sound. That's bogus. Uh, the wristbands, I think those are in here. You saw that zero control by wearing the little wristband with deed in it. Um, the one, it's in that little book. There's a guy back there. Mr. Dutter, are you called that uh, the Florida resident mosquito guy? Yeah, hold that up for him. That guy right there goes into some more depth about, um, you know, some of the other products like those thermocells. Uh, I think that was kind of a mixed bag of how well those work. Again, the best thing is spray yourself down the deep or just cover yourself up. Okay, this is another important thing you need to do is keep them out of your house because these daytime biters that carry this disease will hang out in your house and keep living in your house. So um, you want to make sure your screens are in good order and you want to do a little run through in the evening. It's typically what I do when I see mosquitoes flying around. You know, I go around at night and make sure I've gotten all the mosquitoes because they'll bite you where they sleep in. Typically, I go over by where the dogs hang out and you can see the mosquitoes are kind of like over in that area. Um, but you know, they like hang out at the back door, so when you open the door and come in, you know, like you get two or three mosquitoes every time they fly in. So it's a good idea to go around those uh, electronic uh, swap swappers with their, I don't know what the right word is, they look like a tennis racket, you push a button and they're electric, those are really fun. Practice <laughs> <laughs> your, you know, your stroke too, uh, but they're really fun and gratifying to get those mosquitoes in this happen. Uh, so I put this picture in there because I just thought it was really cool. Again, screens were invented, in, or screens were patented and like started to be sold in the early 1900s. This is from the 1930s, I believe, 1920s. I forget the year this went out. But you know, there weren't a lot of cameras around back then, so this was a big deal. I think someone like got screened on their back porch and they were like, come on over and take a picture of my back porch with screen like this. This is a big deal. So okay, this is what made living in Florida possible back then were screens. Um, you know, air conditioner came along much longer, and now we got layer all of that are here. You know, that's you know that's the only reason we're here. Um, so keep screens in good order. Go around, check them, make sure there's not holes, make sure they're up against the window nice and tight. Uh, I think we're about there, folks. Uh, more resources for all this stuff. Um, Centers for Disease Control and the Department of Health, they have a lot of this good general information like we got here. I have the DOH, uh, the Florida Department of Health brochure on Zika protection back there. You're welcome to take that. Leon County Mosquito Control, I have brochures for them and I also have pencils. So take a pencil, put it by your phone, you know, your cabinet, um, so you can have their number close by. They will come. You call them, and if, if mosquitoes are bad, you can call them. They'll do. A, they'll actually come to your house and do a, a, a fogging in your yard. They will check for larvae, and actually, they use the same products of this BTI. Actually, have their. They actually gave me some of the stuff they use. As you can see, it's you know the same little dunks. Uh, and some of these are briquettes. Um, they'll go around. They'll inspect. If they find a bunch of larvae, they'll put some of the BTI down. Um, and they, you can also let them know if they're really bad. They'll do the, you know, they'll make a truck come by, they'll have a fog truck come by and eat. But again, remember those daytime biters are the, the worst for disease. That's up to us to make sure we get it. Uh, this Florida Medical Entomology Lab. If you're interested in mosquitoes and you're a science geek like myself, you might find some cool stuff. They got really cool pictures um, of all sorts of different things, mosquito related. So in summary, you know, source reduction is the best way to reduce these disease-carrying mosquitoes. 
you know, that three to five days, Monday and Friday, do a little walk around the yard, drink everything, if you uh, standing water, um, use the PTI, the water sides. If you're outside, cover yourself up, use deep, and make sure those, those screens work. And now that you know all of this, go tell your neighbors, go tell everyone, um, spread the word, help more folks, you know, learn what to do with mosquitoes. And I believe that is it. Uh, and I will take any questions you may have. Yes, sir. If the GMO mosquitoes can't reproduce, are the genes in individual mosquitoes altered? Yeah, they are. They're taking the male mosquito. They're taking. Uh, they're growing male mosquitoes in the lab, and they're introducing genes. Oh, well, I guess before they're born, right? Somewhere in the. Somewhere in the development, somewhere in the egg stage, I guess, they're inserting these genes so that when they hatch and become flying males, this gene is in them. And then they just let them all loose in, the, in nature. And they do that with individual eggs? They're do yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Go scientists. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, just over my back fence, there's a huge stormwater drainage ditch. Okay. As I understand, these bad bugs like artificial containers. Do I need to be concerned about spraying in that area? Does it, does it hold water for more than three to five days? It holds water. Oh, sixty five. Con oh, uh, yes. You would. You want to be concerned again if it's holding water that long? There may be a good kind of uh, ecology built up in the ditch, so there may be other predators of those mosquito larvae. And you know, mosquito control will tell you that these. These natural wetlands and even some of these ponds that are kind of, you know, must hold water that long because it's kind of close to a natural wetland area. And so there may be some ecology from those natural areas coming in and living in the ditch. You know, mosquito control will tell that those are not the main source of these um, these really bad guys. Yeah, in the neighborhood where they just got Zika, I just had a meeting the other day and they did a trap. They set some traps up where people, they meant the, the folks in the neighborhood had the same issue. There was a drainage ditch that holds water. Um, they did a trap overnight, and what they found is that only like 25-30% uh, were the Asian tiger mosquito, and the rest were our native mosquitoes that really aren't a problem for things like Zika. Now, West Nile, encephalitis, heartworm, it might be a problem. But that's where if you think it's a problem that mosquito control hasn't been out, you know, give them a call, let them know that you got this ditch behind your house, you're concerned. They'll go out there, they'll do a little dump test, they'll count the larvae, and if there's a certain threshold, they'll actually treat it with some of the BTI. Especially if it's a if it's a county drain season, you definitely want to give them a problem. The birds have a problem with me emptying their baths. So do I put the dunkers in You can put the dunkers in there. Yeah, the, for bird bass, I'd probably recommend some of these because you only need a little bit. I mean, I remember, I just read this the other day, but you only need one teaspoon per 25 square feet of area. So it's very, you know, just a couple little drops of this into the bird bath would control it for about, I think it's about a week or two. 7 to 14 days. Since I could probably bequeath part of that to my hairs, I would use so little. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, I noticed in the store over there they have uh, a smaller. Um, they have a smaller one, something about this size that comes with the bait, the granules as well. Yeah, I've had one of those for over a year, and I use them in my. I use them pretty often, but you don't need very much, so it's. How about propane? I was talking about that. I was talking about that earlier today. I bought one of those things. At my old house, instead of this is just from personal experience. I, I don't think they mentioned the propane things in there, but personal experience, I bought one, set it up for a week, and it was like a test because those things are kind of expensive. Um, I went out after the week, and there was you know 20, 30, maybe 50 mosquitoes in there, and I said, look, I could like just hang outside and kill more of these right. myself than because you know, they went through propane pretty quickly, so they had to. I had to get another propane tank. I must have had it for more than a week, but um, anyway, we decided it wasn't worth it, and we took it back. And fortunately, this store here has money back. Can, yes, can I just say that my husband used to put what got a fountain and bear baths and. And I've got six cats and a dog, and he used to put bleach, and I used to have squirrels come down to the fountain and birds and drink. He used to put bleach in there, but I put a stop to that. The dunks and the other 
um, things are all pet safe. They pet so the wild animals and the domestic animals. Exactly. So the yeah. Yeah. that are in my backyard is official. I always put this in there every couple of days. And, or, you know, typically yeah. I go and I look. If I see any of them starting to wiggle in there, I'll go put more. Um, but it usually lasts about a week. Um, and I give that water to chickens. I put I put that water actually in the bird baths. Yeah. So I kind of treat it with some of the, the little granules. Um, I've given it to dogs. I mean, it's, it's pretty it's pretty harmless to most other things except for these mosquitoes. Uh, yes, so the mosquito slaughter you mentioned. Where do you get those? <laughs> um, you know, Walmart, Target, any old place will have those. They're lots of fun. You know, yes. like yes. them. Yes. They do. They do. You'll hear a little. <laughs> turn it on, turn it on and off. He's got a little right at the hand where you're holding it. Little buttons are good for husbands. Yes, yeah, yeah. Or kids, you know, it doesn't hurt very much, so you can, you know, smack your kid with it around here just for fun. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, I had a good question. Those mosquitoes are pollinators, and we wipe them out. We call them ourselves a problem. So, I've, yeah, it's probably unlikely that we would wipe mosquitoes out, but today we would release a bunch of these GMO mosquitoes. Now, the kind of the cool thing with that is it's specific to that species of mosquito. So say we wipe out, and I've, I've actually read different experts and scientists kind of going over like what they think would happen if we exter you know, uh, extirpated mosquitoes, and uh, they go back and forth. So we take out one species, say, say that is possible, and we actually are successful at eliminating that yellow fever mosquito, they're like, you know, something is going to, you know, it's going to be a little blip in the ecosystem overall, and something will take its place. The thing is, maybe some worse mosquito will tell us when that happens, so we don't know, so, um, but I seriously know all mosquitoes will be eliminated, I don't think we could ever do that. Um, we have to spray some pretty toxic stuff and wipe out so many other things. But I don't see that happening, so we kind of got to deal with it, you know. It's pretty good time to be. Well, um, we're learning. That's a lot of old stuff, so we're getting better. Yes, sir. Now, how do the Indians, how do the Seminoles survive 200 years ago in these swarms of mosquitoes? What do they use for protection? Well, you know, again, some of these, these mosquitoes that carry these really bad diseases aren't native. So before the English came over and the Spanish and brought everything with them, they would have mostly been dealing with these nighttime annoying mosquitoes. Now, I have, you know, I'm kind of, I like history. I read up with Pleasure with Native Americans. I've heard things from wax myrtle. They used to take wax myrtle and, like, roll it, you know, rub it all over them. And, like, fish oil. So they would take fish oil or... I don't exactly know, but they would kind of like rub the fish on them, which maybe that blocks the fur bones, you know, that you know, attracts the mosquitoes. But the other thing, too, is you develop, you know, folks do, even with the Zika, like once you get it, you start to develop an immunity to it, and it doesn't get you again. Um, so I think, you know, they evolved in this, you know, area. Um, the Native Americans have lived for a long time, lots of generations to, you know, deal with this. And I mean, I'm sure they were swatting mosquitoes every night. Um, but they just didn't get as many of the diseases because some of these diseases weren't even here. What does it uh, affect pregnant women so with okay. this disease? Okay, getting the Zika. So I'm not a doctor, but I'll tell you what I know about the OH and all the, you know, what I've learned from listening to all these folks. Um, I, I, exactly why, you know, it's bad for pregnant women, for sure, because it, it gets into the you know, it's in their body and it gets into the child, and that's where the child develops this microcephaly. There's some other yeah. uh, Goulon Barrard syndrome or something or other. I don't know if they really know the whole process of what's going on there, um, but what you don't hear so, mosquitoes carry it, it's also sexually transmitted. Um, and what you'll hear is they talk a lot about, you know, women doing things to protect themselves, especially if they want to get pregnant. What you don't hear a lot about is men actually hold it in their bodies longer. So men can carry, if they get Zika, you can actually have Zika for about six months with your hand, and it stays in your body. And now, it stays in your semen, so I don't know how deep we want to go here. <laughs> but, you know, it, it hangs out in, in men's semen, and for, I think the longest they found is like six months, uh, a man holding onto the virus. So if you're a man... And your partner wants to get pregnant anytime soon, and you've been to a, a place where Zika is common, 
Um, you need to wait at least six months before you try to conceive with your partner. Whereas in a woman, it gets, you know, in the rest of us, it's only about eight weeks, they say, for the virus to kind of go through your, your go take its course in your body. And, and once you have it, I don't think you can't get it again. Um, I was going to say something else there. Oh, shoot. I had something in mind that I was going to say. I lost it. They're working on a vaccine. Uh, they actually, I just read something the other night that some scientists have they've taken it through the um, trials with animals, with some monkeys, uh, and they got very good results, and they're actually going to start human trials of a vaccine. Apparently, it was a lot easier than they had anticipated to come up with a vaccine for Zika. So they're actually working on it, um, and they think it could be a year or two and they might have a vaccine for it. Do you know if it's a live virus or a dead virus? Uh, that I don't know. I know that the Zika is considered a flavovirus, but that helps. I just remember that from something I just said <laughs> yesterday. Yes, sir. I've heard that the machine is a weak virus. Would it help to sleep under a fan or when you're outside yeah. have a, a large fan blowing on you? Fans work great. Um, if we have something outside, typically we'll put the, you know, typically we don't right now because the mosquitoes are so bad it's hot. But yeah, if we're out there, um, you put a fan, they are weak flyers. Um, the Asian tiger and the yellow fever mosquito, they're not very good flyers. I think they can only go about 600 yards or so. So like uh, these Zika related cases that have uh, been in Leon County, the action plan, what the county does is they basically canvas 600 yards around the property where that person lives because they're not thinking that the mosquitoes are gonna be able to get much further than that. Some of these native mosquitoes that live in the swamps, some of them could fly like moths. Um, so we can't they fly 600 yards and stop and rest and have to rest? <laughs> um, you know, I need to ask them that because I think, but they might have a little range that they kind of hang out in. Because remember, there's all the other mosquitoes 600 yards away that they're all fighting for resources in their little area. So that may be just their little their area of of movement of habitation. The territory. Uh, there's still a lot of research to be done. There's still a lot of research to be done, of course. Yeah. Uh, and we're actually, I was letting some folks know, some master gardeners that the map showing the albopictus, the Asian tiger up north with the yellow fever down south, they still think that there's pockets of yellow fever mosquito throughout Florida. And even that, you know, the large range I showed you on know, the big map, even in the other states. So some master gardeners are actually doing some research for the Florida, entomology, the Florida Medical Entomology Lab. We're, we're putting out cups, and we're getting eggs, and we're sending them off to the researchers, and they're trying to identify which uh, mosquitoes people are collecting. And mosquito control is doing the same thing. They have traps set up, and then they are taking them to the lab, getting them identified. And so far, we've only been getting the Asian tiger mosquito, which is good because it's less, it seems to be less of a carrier of the, um, the Zika, you know, less potential for it to spread Zika. Like malaria, I think we've come immune to that. You know, they used to be as worried as mosquitoes. Yeah. The other diseases that they carry. Yeah. Um, there's, well, there's, and there's medicines for it now, too, to treat it. So, um, oh, the other thing I was going to say that, okay, this came back to me. The, the with the Zika, um, only 20% of the folks who have Zika actually get the symptoms. So that's where they're really kind of, they're nervous down in South Florida because the whole, there's another 80% that actually have it that don't know. Uh, and that don't go to the doctor and may not take precautions, so um, that's why they think of this. This, the, you know, they're actually mosquitoes are spreading it in that little area around Miami right now, um, and they think that likely what happened is someone that didn't even know they had it was, you know, just out and about and got bit by mosquitoes. Can I just mention? I have a lot of people throwing me out for lemongrass and a type of geranium that we sell that they think repels mosquitoes. It really doesn't bring out a mosquito. I wondered if you'd mention that, you know, because we did you okay, I'm sorry. I just, the citronella, yeah, and everybody thinks, you know, they're the whole mosquito. I mean, basically, if you grab, if you take the whole plant and rub it all over, like, Americans you may get some protection for a couple minutes, but I don't think just having it around the yard is going to keep it away. No. There's another product that I think you guys have, and I've seen some other nurseries carry it, that is geranium oil. Uh, it actually might be the same as uh, keep doing it. 
It might be the same as this here. This is geranium oil, rosemary, peppermint oil, and some other ingredients. Uh, this is a farther product, but I've also seen one that's like a granular one that people are, um, that you just kind of sprinkle in your yard as a repellent. That may work. I haven't seen any like research on it to see if it's actually effective, but it may be worth a try and see what happens. Um, Master Gardeners also did some research on magnolia leaves because a lot of people talk about magnolia leaves, you know, harboring and breeding mosquitoes. Well, so far, the magnolia leaves have not held water long enough to breed mosquitoes. So what I think is going on is that mosquitoes, when they're adults, they that's just their hangout area. They like dark, shady, moist places. They hang out in the leaf litter. They're waiting for a mate. They're waiting to find a blood meal. They're waiting to lay some eggs somewhere. And so they're just hanging out there. So don't go cutting down all your magnolia trees because you think you're going to breed mosquitoes. You know, for the most part, uh, we only had water standing in a, mosquito, in a magnolia leaf for like a day. And this was when we had lots of rain. Uh, actually, one of the master gardeners gave me a very detailed, uh, you know, this day, this time, how much rain we had just gotten, how much water was in the leaves. And the next day, and they were very thorough. And yeah, the, the, the water didn't hold longer than a day. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there anything that you can spray that doesn't kill everything else? No. There's nothing for, to kill mosquitoes that's not going to hurt now. Not as a fog. I don't believe so. Uh, uh, and even uh, your cats, some of this stuff on the fogger, so for cat folks, the fog truck, uh, you probably want to keep your cat away because some of those products uh, I've read. Um, folks that have cats, the cat, it gets it through, it works through the nervous system and the cats kind of. Um, they start acting funny because they're getting impacted by some of these uh, chemicals. Um, that malathion that I mentioned as one of the adulticides, um, down south, they actually they only use that at last resort because they've actually, the mosquitoes are becoming resistant to that uh, because it's been used for a long time. So just like we have some weeds that are getting resistant to Roundup or glyphosate, uh, we have mosquitoes that are becoming resistant to some of the products they use to fight them. Yes, ma'am. Um, what about dryer sheets? I've been told if you broke your stuff with dryer sheets. I didn't find anything in there on that. I don't remember what's in the booklet back there, but I would I would probably say not much. The only thing it's going to do is probably it's going to hide some of that smell. So that might, you know, it might provide a little bit of coverage, but probably not for very long, and it, it may not be too effective. So. Uh, I haven't seen any any research, so you know we're University of Florida. I got to stick to the facts. Uh, yes, sir. You had a question? I'm just wondering if mixing out your bird mats every trip to the was sufficient. Yeah, yeah perfect. Uh, just dump it in, put some fresh water in there. Uh, yeah. Every three days, you'll be fine. If you're eating mosquito larvae in, in the bird mat, do the birds eat some? Um, you know, I sometimes will have, like, when I use the old grain barrel buckets um, and I give it to my chickens, I see the larvae and so I'm thinking the chickens are going to, you know, every now and again maybe pull one out of there. Bird wise, um, uh, most of the things that eat the larvae are going to be other um, kind of aquatic things like uh, frogs or fish. Uh, I'm not sure if the, the, the birds are going to eat the larvae because I think. I don't know if they'll be able to pick that out. They might. But I would just say dump it and put fresh water in there. Um, we didn't talk about what preys on the adults as much, but dragonflies, birds, uh, bats are all very good predators, so you want to try to encourage you know, uh, bats. So I'm sure if we almost all of us have bats in Tallahassee. If you look at the right time of day, you'll see the bats fluttering over. You know, uh, Keep them around. They're good. Um, hummingbirds. I actually learned hummingbirds are a big predator of mosquitoes as well. Well, those the North of Mall, they didn't kill, did they, on the backs there? Are they dead? Did I they don't know what happened to them. I think the bathhouse is still there, so it's probably... Uh, well, I guess with that feed store was so many years, I believe mean, that's where they were. Huh. I know I went by there not too long ago, and I remember, I remember seeing the bathhouse. We have a bathhouse at our demo garden. You can come well, see it. Well, the ceiling did ask for that one. Oh, that's right. I remember that story. I don't know if they're still over there or not at the mall. Well, if they leave that location, they just relocate someplace else. Probably, and hopefully not to your roof or something. Like yeah. the Northwood Mall. Oh, 
You wrote that one because you're talking the Northwood Mall. They did exterminate them from there. Uh, I know there's a Cypress restaurant. There's a house right next to Cypress restaurant. And I remember one night I saw them all coming out of the chimney. Uh, <laughs> big, huge you know, swarm of bats. Are pretty cool. Yes, sir. Uh, how long uh, if I fog the shrubs between me and stormwater drainage? Mm -hmm. Now, well, first of all, is it effective as a barrier? And then, how long would it reasonably maintain? You, you have it, it would depend on the product. So, I'm sure I'm not, I'll just read the label. Anytime you use any of these products, always read the label very carefully. Well, I'm talking about the one that you. You these these type of things here? With an electrical device. With an electrical device? Uh, oh, this thing, like this. Yeah, yes. this type of fire? Well, let's see, here's the... the uh, I don't want to break their label. Maybe just put one of the dunks in the ditch. If it's not flowing water, mm -hmm. uh, well, that's the problem. It flows sometimes. Uh, that's just going more green. Yeah. Um, if it's standing water, the ducts work really well. If it's flowing water, not as much, but you'll probably have less mosquitoes than flowing water because they prefer kind of the stack of slow moving stuff. Yeah. Um, anyway, I've been looking through this, but as far as how long it will last, it's going to be uh, you know up to each product, and I'm sure it'll they don't have the information in there. This one actually does say it only affects the midges, black flies, and mosquitoes. So I wonder if this is it doesn't say BTI, but it's. Maybe they've come up with something similar to it. That's actually kind of great. Um, this is good. This one, you know, it said it's uh, killed. To, well, it's listed to kill, so I don't know. Oh, wait, to kill listed insects, including. So it probably does kill a lot of other insects as well. So um, it may provide a barrier, but, you know, they could come from the other direction as well. So they could fly over the truck. <laughs> they could try to fly over the a big fan. <laughs> Uh, any more questions? All right, well, I appreciate you all coming, and uh, make sure uh, Tallahassee Nursery is being very nice. Folks that uh, come to the talk today are getting that coupon. Yes, and make sure you, if you didn't get a coupon, I've got them here. And there's information in the back there that for the uh, resident guide to mosquito control, uh, the mosquito, the mosquito control, brochure, pencil.